Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of the Hammer and Nail Show. It's Thursday night and big game coming up, NFC Championship Edition. So that big game means that Jesse and I need to have a little bit bigger panel to join us today, tonight. So we have Aaron from 49ers First Takes with us. And then uh, on the other side there, we have Rob from The Left Shoe on uh, on Twitter and he, his great uh, YouTube channel as well. And of course, Jesse and myself. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Doing fantastic. Excited for the NFC Championship game, baby. Crazy. <laughs> Looking back to where we were at three and five, who would have thought that we'd be having a discussion about a, a game at this point in the season, uh, you know, back back after that Arizona game, right? I know I didn't. I remember what nope. I said walking out of the stadium that day. So big time. Big, big time. turnaround for the San Francisco 49ers. And, and, and something to be grateful for, just to take a moment and appreciate where the Niners are and just express that gratitude that we have meaningful January football. Multiple games of meaningful January football. Yeah, let's go. We got to get one more in February after this one. But before we start real quick, I just want to shout out to, uh, to Jeremy. What up, Jeremy? Kevin for checking us out. And then we have... Uh, Ekim, and he's got it to, to all of us here at one point. Uh, so really good group. And, and yes, it's an all-star crew. We had to bring on Aaron and, and, and I mean, and look at the, the cameras that these guys all have. I, I got to catch up because this is fantastic. But that's, <laughs> that's good. Let's just jump right into it. Cause I know we have a hard stop at about seven 30 cause we all have stuff to do tonight, but uh, let's just jump into it real quick. So the first topic that we put together was most oppressive postseason so far. LA Rams or San Francisco 49ers Jesse yeah so for me I, I have to go with the 49ers and I, I just don't think the Rams have had that impressive of a postseason I think the Cardinals were left for dead the moment that they entered the playoffs they've lost four or five I believe they just didn't look good Hopkins was out that was a huge miss for them and then Tampa Bay I understand this was the defending Super Bowl champs that being said that was not the defending Super Bowl champs. There was no Tristan Wirfs. There was no Antonio Brown. There was no Godwin. And I just felt like that team was ready to be beat as well. And I said it last week, and I feel that way. Green Bay versus San Francisco was for the NFC Championship. Mm. I thought Green Bay was going to be the toughest test for the 49ers. They played in six days. It was their third straight road game. The fact that the 49ers have ran through this gauntlet, Dallas was the number one offense, Green Bay was the number one team, it is clearly the San Francisco 49ers have had the most impressive postseason out of these two teams. I tend to agree with the fact that the 49ers have had the most impressive of those two postseasons. The only difference that I have from, from Jesse is, is being pretty impressed with the Rams to this point. I, I agree that Arizona was a house of cards, right? And it came down in pretty embarrassing fashion. Like, it, it, it honestly makes me feel a little less stellar about the NFC West, just watching the way in which they folded. It was, I was embarrassed. I'm, I'm being honest there. I was embarrassed for Kyler Murray and the way that unfolded and the way it, it, it made them seem. And so I, I can't give the Rams a lot of credit for that one, but they did handle business. What I will give them supreme credit for is going into Tampa Bay to, to travel in the playoffs. Regardless, I think Jesse's correct in the fact that this was not a Tampa Bay team at, at their peak. But regardless, going into Tampa Bay to jump out to that lead and then to defend that comeback effort by the greatest of all time. I mean, there had to be some fear that crept into their minds. To me, that was impressive to pull that off as a win. But the Niners getting it done in any way, shape, or form, going into Dallas and beating the number one offense. Again, as Jesse mentioned, going into Green Bay in the weather and combating both the number one team in the NFC and the freaking freezing temperatures, which I can attest to having been there in those aluminum stands sitting on my frozen tuchus. But yes, it was uh, the Niners to me, that fashion of winning in any way possible is much more impressive. I mean, you just look at the Rams and all the household names they have and the expectation that was placed on them before the season, you know, you know, they, they, they make all the, the hot trades. They don't care about draft picks. Um, it's all about win now for them. And uh, so, you know, and they've pretty much stayed the course all year. They did what they were expected to do. The Niners started the year 
just getting in their own way. I mean, a lot of times they were beating themselves, uh, but just to see them become like these road warriors where they go into Dallas, a place where, you know, maybe some people thought we didn't have a chance of winning just because of high power, how high power they are in offense. Um, and they have a pretty, you know, pretty formidable defense. They have some players. They're not scrubs at all. And then to go into Green Bay in the most, I mean, the conditions were the worst um, against probably one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, not not named Tom Brady. And, you know, Devontae Adams, of course. And just to do it the way we did it, where we didn't even score an offensive touchdown. Of, I think without a shadow of a doubt, and this is not the homer in me, this is just a football fan. I think the Niners, without question, have had the more impressive run. Yeah, I, I think we're all on the on the on the same boat here. I, I do. I think it was the 49ers as well. They, the fact that they had to go on the road for both of their games, I think is is one of the bigger pieces. Um, I think everybody that's in this roundtable felt like the 49ers had a really good chance against against Dallas because that matchup favored them. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case against Green Bay, although I think we felt like they could win it, but it was going to be a, a tougher struggle for them. Uh, and I think it's played out how we. We all kind of looked at these first two games, uh, and I think the same thing with the Rams. They had a little bit easier road because, at least in the first round, because uh, as Jesse and Rob pointed out already, Arizona was falling apart by that point. And I mean, our, uh, Kyler Murray just threw it up in the out of the end zone for seven points for the Rams too. So, you know, there was they had a little bit of a break there in round one. The round two game, I think, showed everybody why this is a good matchup for the 49ers. You know, they, they had that big lead that that should have been a cakewalk for them. And instead they have to pull it off at the end of the game uh, when that should have been uh, put away. So I, I think that uh, I would say the 49ers for sure with the the more impressive postseason run to get to this point. The Rams almost ended up like a forever meme like the Falcons did 27 to three there. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, that would have been sweet. <laughs> That's that's right. They were only one point difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Exactly. That's uh let's jump over to the next one. So we know we're getting we've heard a lot about this already, right? The third time that these these two teams have matched up this year. Foreigners won six in a row against the Rams. The law of averages kind of are you a little bit nervous about that catching up with the 49ers? And we'll start off with Aaron on this one. Absolutely. Uh I I I, uh, I think I might have tweeted it or told somebody like, oh, you know, I, I, I know I'd be stupid to say this, but I was really hoping for Tampa just because we haven't played them. And, uh, you know, and uh, Tom Brady looked like he was having a real rough time uh, with pass protection in that game. And I'm thinking, oh, the Niners are going to feast. This would be great. You know, they don't have Godwin. I think we have a real shot, you know. Um, I just think. You know, it's two teams that haven't met before, so there's going to be a lot of unknowns going into that game. But, uh, you know, it is what it is with the Rams. Uh, do I think the law of averages could catch up in this one? Absolutely. But the game still needs to be played. Uh, our fans are some of the best in the world as far as road, road as they go when they go into road, uh, you know, road fans. And so I think that matters. I think that psychological advantage matters. And so, I think the Niners just got to go into this game and, and continue playing the same way that they'd been playing and, and force the Rams to kind of adjust. Because to me, all in a way, to me, the, the pressure's on the Rams. The Rams were expected to be here. It's in their house. Uh, so the Niners, in a way, at least for me, are playing a little bit with house money. They weren't expected to be here at this point. So um, not that I want that kind of you know thought going into my, other people's minds. That, you know, the Niners are just you know lucky to be there or whatever, but same time, I think the pressure's more on the Rams, so I just think the Niners need to go in there and impose their will and uh, uh, make this uh, law of averages thing kind of irrelevant. Yeah, I think there's merit to it in general. The idea that it's difficult to continually beat a team, that is real. I mean, look at a, a, any type of a, a playoff scenario where you have a best of five or a best of seven. Even when you have scenarios where it's a wildly more talented team, you oftentimes see that other lesser talented team sneak away with one. And so there's there's merit to that it's very difficult to beat a team once in a season it's, it's even more difficult to beat them twice in a season it is even more difficult to go for that third one but statistically speaking and i believe i'm pulling this from memory correctly it's happened in the nfl 21 times and and the team that's been 2-0 and going into it has won that third game 14 of those 21 times so 66 percent 
of the times this has occurred. The team that won the, t- the two in the regular season went on to win the third in the postseason. And that bears out because you don't beat a team twice in one year just by chance most of the time. You beat them because you're the better team. You have a favorable uh, edge in the matchup. And I think that's the case for the San Francisco 49ers. So, yes, I'm a little concerned in that this is football. The ball can bounce in funny ways in any given game, any given Sunday. Either team can win. And so you can't be certain about any matchup. But the 49ers can target the Rams in some very specific ways with our physical run style, with our ability to to target over the middle Jimmy Garoppolo's strengths. Uh, Those also happen to be the weaknesses for the Rams who are built to get after the quarterback. So I believe this favors the 49ers. But yeah, in the back of my mind, there's a little a little uh, a little nerves, a a few nerves, a a little bit of excitement, some butterflies in the tummy. I'm going to be stressed out sitting in the stands of SoFi Stadium. Yeah, as Rob said, it it is hard to beat a team three times in one year, but only because it's hard to play a team three times in one year. Statistically speaking, chances are the team that won twice is going to win that third time. It's it's like if you bet and you go into the casino and you go to the roulette table and you see red has popped up six times in a row, your natural inclination is to say, I'm putting my money on black. But reality is it's still the same exact chance that red's going to pop up again. And this game is going to be built based off of who the better team is, period. It doesn't matter who's won six in a row, 10 in a row. None of that matters. These are two different teams over the course of this duration. And I believe even two different teams than what they were three weeks ago. So the better team is going to win. And the 49ers have as good of a chance as anybody because they have the perfect style to beat this team. So I would say that law of averages could catch up, but that's not going to be the reason for victory or defeat in this one. Yeah, the the one thing on this one that I will say is is because there has been a lot of discussion on this, right? The, the three wins and and like Rob mentioned, and that's one of the, the numbers that I've heard a lot too. It's like sixty five percent of the twenty twenty one times it's been the team that's won the first three two has won the third. It changes when you start to look at them playing on the road. However, uh, when they've played on the road for the third game, it's a fifty fifty split two and two. Uh, the last time that this happened in the in a championship game was 1999, when the Titans beat the Jaguars. That's, so that's the last time it's happened in a, in a championship game. So, and the last time that it's happened in general uh, was 2004. It was the Rams over the Seahawks. So that's just a little bit of a background, though. So it's it's really a 50-50 thing. And so at that point, you start to say, okay, who is the better team? And, and look, the 49ers beat this team without some of their better players the first time around. We don't even know if they're, if Trent Williams is going to be able to play this week, but at the same time, they already did it once. Can they, can they go in there and do it twice without Trent Williams and, and with, with uh, Tom Compton? Uh, it's going to take a lot, but they seem to have what it takes to, uh, to slow this team down. And we're going to get to it a little bit later, but I'm going to just go ahead and say it right now, the front four on the defensive front for the 49ers, if they do their business, this game's this game. We know the outcome of this game because that's that's where it starts and finishes. Because Matthew Stafford doesn't like to get hit more than other quarterbacks. Jack, my, I have a question though. Who's the who's the real home team here? I was going <laughs> to say my point of contention is know. that this yes. is a home game, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I I get it. That that is one of the things, right? That you're you're one hundred percent right there. So <laughs> it'll be it'll be fun to to see that. And I'm glad to hear Rob's going down there. I might have to chase him around and see if I can find him while I'm down there. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> um, so let's this, this, this jump over now. We got an, another one. And, you know, we talked about this. The, the Green Bay defense was really good against the 49ers on uh, Saturday night. They were also really good against the 49ers back in week three. So they, they played against really well against them both times. Can the Rams defense duplicate what we saw from Green Bay, Jesse? Oh, gosh. I... I think they can in one aspect. I think they can in the aspect of getting after Jimmy Garoppolo. I do believe that. I think they can duplicate that. Von Miller's playing very well. Aaron Donald, for whatever reason, just doesn't show up against the 49ers, but maybe this changes things. I think they can duplicate that side of things. I do not think they can duplicate slowing down the run game for two reasons. One, the weather in Green Bay made it very clear 
that it was going to be a run first game. We everybody knows the Reiner, the 49ers are going to run first. But it was even more obvious once we got to the second half and neither quarterback could really throw more than four or five yards downfield consistently. So I think that's number one. Number two, Green Bay has a hell of a linebacker sitting in the middle of that defense. That is something that the Rams don't have. Their linebacking core is very, very suspect. One of the weaker linebacking cores in the league, in my opinion. And so I think for that reason, they cannot duplicate what the Green Bay Packers were able to do in the run game, but they can for sure in the pass game. I tend to agree with what Jesse's saying here. And and let me say, from, from someone who was in the stands for that Green Bay game, that weather was debilitating. I mean, you witnessed it firsthand. I'm sure it translated over the screen, but it was painfully clear while sitting and shivering there. You'd take off your gloves to, to shoot a video, to text someone, and within 60 seconds, your hands felt like they were going numb. And so... You watch the footing out there. You watch the uh, linemen, our offensive linemen, attempting to operate in space, which is a critical component of our run game producing those chunk plays, of being able to get it to the second level. And I thought we were missing that. I thought it was very hard-hitting, smash-mouth football, power running style, bodies colliding in the cold, a lot of pain on both sides, warriors in the trenches. Like it, it was everything you would ask for from a Lambo freezing game in January. And it's just going to be a faster track when we get down to LA. It, it's going to allow for significantly more plays to develop in that run game. So I do not believe that they will have the same level of success that the, the Packers did in stopping the run. I also agree with Jesse, though, that, that it's very possible if the 49ers get into significant third and long situations, the Rams are built, built to get after the passer in that scenario. So, yes, I do think that you could see a similar circumstance where the right side of the 49ers offensive line is highly suspect in those third and long, obvious passing situations. I think you could see the, the sacks on Jimmy Garoppolo get up to three or four in this game. It's To me, it's highly dependent on how the run game breaks out. If the Niners are able to consistently pick up four or five yards a chunk and they're in these third and manageable situations, Jimmy will attack that second level. The linebackers were clear sailing. But if the run game struggles at points and they're able to get after the passer, I do think they'll drag Jimmy down. Yeah, I mean, the Niners are compromised at both tackles uh, if Trent doesn't play. So, and the Rams can rush the passer. So, it's kind of a, you know, it's a scary proposition for the 49ers. However, like Rob was saying, you get yourself in a, you know, second and third in manageables, which, you know, with Elijah Mitchell, that seems to be a pretty constant thing, at least from my observation. He tends to always fall forward and it's always like, you know, third and four, third and three. The Niners could get into those kind of situations where that's a quick pass, a slant, you know, a, you know, a, a shallow cross, whatever, which Jimmy, you know, as much as I've been kind of on him, is kind of where he makes his money. Then I think the Niners have a shot. The, the Niners can't get into like third and completely predictable situations because, yeah, Jimmy's going to get Jimmy's going to get dumped on his head if that's the case. So the running game has to be really good in this game. The Niners. I mean, if they have to use Kittle and pass protection, you got to do what you have to do at this point if uh, your offensive line is compromised to the point theirs is right now. So, yeah, uh, Green Bay, I think, like, Green Bay had the elements, too, like you said. So, like, I don't know, man. I don't want to get hit in the cold, and I don't want to hit somebody in the cold. So, all that combined, I think the Niners will have more success against the Rams, but they do have to find a way to pass – you know, protect Jimmy Garoppolo to the best of their abilities. Yeah, I don't think that the Rams can duplicate Green Bay's defense because they don't have Kenny Clark in the middle mm. and they don't have the linebackers that they have as well. Because Kenny Clark, if you watch from from the jump on that, he just destroys the middle of the 49ers defensive line more, way more than we've ever seen Aaron Donald do, uh, other than maybe the second game in, in Los Angeles last year when they had Nick Mullins. Uh, because you know, between, and that's what we saw from Green Bay though in, in week one, so or week three, right? So what we saw them do in week three is what we saw them do in, in on, on Saturday. We haven't seen the, the Rams be able to do that. You get to the linebacker group of the Rams and they don't, I mean, I'm sorry, but but 51 
uh, he's just not the guy that's going to stop this this team. I can't remember his name right now, but he was a seventh round pick a few years ago, and 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 he's he struggles against this team. And he, he's going to make a few plays here and there, but more more often than not, he gets caught chasing his tail. And, and then you start to look at their secondary. You got to remember too. I think one of their safeties is I think they're starting Eric Weddle, right? Who, right. Who wasn't even in the, in the league at the start? You know, he was retired. And I think the other guy is thirty three, who was a special teams guy for the majority of the year. Um, and outside of Ramsey, their secondary play is, isn't. Uh, it's something that I think that we've seen. We've already seen Garoppolo take advantage of them. He threw for over 300 yards against them uh, coming off. That was his first game with a thumb, right? And he threw for 300 yards in that game. So if, if they can get the running game going, I, I think we'll see Garoppolo have some success. He just seems to, he hasn't lost the Rams, has he? He's he's perfect against them, right? Six and oh, you know, going back to 2017. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I feel I do not feel like the uh, like the uh, Rams have the have what it takes to duplicate what Green Bay's been able to do against the Fort Anders. Plus, they don't even the even the secondary. Kenny Clark is is an absolute uh, key to, to what Green Bay was able to do, and I'm glad you called that out, Jack. Because if it had gotten through and all four of us had missed Kenny Clark, that would have been criminal. Yes, that ability. The Niners really struggle with that interior pressure, and, and you just can't picture the Rams being able to accomplish that because they don't have a Kenny Clark in there. Aaron Donald's a different type of player. He wreaks different havoc. Yeah, and, and what, what makes it different with Green Bay is also, it's not as Clark at the first level, but then 59, and again, I, I don't remember their names, but 59, that linebacker for, for Green Bay is just so good at, at filling the, the holes. And, and they, they were just they, they were really good at that second level, much better than what you see with the Rams. Because the Rams also don't run two linebackers in the middle very much. They usually mm. run that kind of like a 6-1 look, right? So we'll see how it works out. But that's, that's my take. All right, let's jump over to the next one. We'll start off with Aaron on this one. And this is, this is a, an interesting one. Um, you know, I, I don't have the uh, thing on it. But, so let's just jump over here and I'll, I'll bring up another one instead. Is Garoppolo due for a breakout? I think so. I mean, he does really well against the Rams um, almost all the time. Uh, sometimes familiarity is not good uh, in some aspects, but I think with the 49ers and with Garoppolo, Garoppolo seems to thrive when there's a lot of fam- familiarity and stuff that he you know, knows he can do well. Uh, and the, the Rams' weakness is kind of where the Niners' strength, strength is with the passing game, especially when Garoppolo is the quarterback. So, yeah, I definitely think, and, and like I said, I, I'm hard to please with Jimmy, but uh, he's had the Rams number for the most part. So, yeah, I mean, if the Niners could just get a little pass protection for this guy, I mean, I mean, I just think we skill skill position wise, offensively, I just think we're just a, I think the matchup just favors us across the board, man. I mean, tight end, Debo, even Ayuk, Elijah Mitchell. It's just a matter of you know if the Niners' offensive line can you know, do a semblance of anything that is close to good pass protection. I think Jimmy can have his, have his day. Uh, it, a lot of quick stuff, a lot of slants, a lot of digs, a lot of crossers, stuff that he does well. Um, uh, they should mix in a wheel route just in case to see if he can actually hit it this time. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> don't know if that's going to happen, but you know, uh, yeah, I think Jimmy's do. I like, I just think that it's time. I've been so critical of him. A lot of people are critical of him, you know, and it's, you know, there's some merit behind it. He's not been the best in the playoffs, but, you know, at any time, any player can show up and, and make a play. I mean, look at freaking, uh, what's his name who blocked the punt, uh, Jordan Willis, you know, players like that. You see that, that it was coming out of nowhere. No one would have predicted that. So yeah, I think Jimmy has a chance to have a good one here. You just got to give him some time really. I definitely think giving him time to, to complete the passes will be paramount. I don't think that Jimmy Garoppolo is due for a breakout game. And and I say that because I don't think it will be needed. I don't think that that's going to be really the, the game plan that's, that's called for in this one. Now, when I say breakout game, I mean, I don't think he's going to throw for 300 plus. I do think he's going to need to have 
a better game than he has had these these past uh, four, right, in, in throwing these interceptions. I don't know who it was I saw on Twitter, but someone told me that Jimmy had never thrown a pick in four straight, right? And he had, he had had three straight. What a and, But he wasn't going to throw that fourth one. I don't remember who it was that threw that out there. I can't recall. But it was someone on Twitter. And then, lo and behold, there was that pick in, in four straight. But, but certainly, if we're talking about law of averages earlier, now it's even less likely that he's throwing one in this one. So, so I think a clean game is what I'm predicting here. Garoppolo is due for a clean game. I'm going to put him somewhere in that 250 to 275 yards. So you could technically, I think, call that a, a breakout game for Jimmy Garoppolo. We have sort of adjusted our expectations for him based on, on what he is and, and what we know him to be. And therefore, you know, potentially that is the, the, the bar but to me, it's about getting the run game going. That, that the way the 49ers win this one is through creative Shanahan game play, uh, g- play design, game calling. It, it will be one of those where, it, you know, Debo's the star, and then you have Elijah Mitchell chewing up the yardage 4.4 per carry for, you know, 30 carries or whatever we try and run that guy into the ground. But Jimmy's going to have to be clutch. He is going to have to hit some very high-pressure throws. And and ironically, in those moments, he does seem to be as cool as the other side of the pillow. Like It, it is uncanny that in one instance, he's throwing a boneheaded interception where you're like, Jimmy, where did that come from? Didn't you see the linebacker? Like, I saw him, and I'm watching it on a 12-inch TV or whatever the case may be. But But... What we need from Jimmy in this one is to execute. We don't need him to be a gunslinger. We don't need him to be Matthew Stafford chucking it down the field. We need him to complete the the third and six, the third and four, the the, uh, third and 12 on a rare occasion, right? It's those passes that he's going to have to make. I don't care how many touchdowns a man has. I don't care what his completion percentage is in total. I care what his completion percentage is on those critical downs where he's got to hit George Kittle over the middle over the uh, against one of those suspect linebackers and pick up, you know, 30 on yards after the catch. To me, that's the type of game that we're looking for from Jimmy Garoppolo in this one. And I do think he delivers. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll have a topic where Rob and I disagree because we've been on the same page thus far throughout the whole episode. <laughs> But I, I agree with him. I, I don't think it'll be needed. And I'm not sure it's it's going to happen. We talked about the 49ers winning six straight and, and does that law of average play out? And, and we basically said no. So I don't know why this would be any different. My concern is, is that this is the law of average for Jimmy G when he's been hurt. Because we really haven't seen him be great since he's been hurt. We've seen him have a good half. But since he hurt the thumb against Tennessee... Terrible, terrible play. And then he had a good half against the Rams. He was really bad in the first half. He was not very good for a majority of the Cowboys game and Green Bay game. This might be who he is with the injury. So we'll see. I don't think he needs to be great. I just think he needs to protect the ball. I think that's his number one thing that he has to get done this weekend. Just protect the ball and that should be enough. Now, two weeks rest going up against Kansas City, which I think is a really bad defense. I think that could be the breakout game if that's the Super Bowl that happens. But for right now, just get through this one. Don't have too many boneheaded plays. Limit yourself to maybe one turnover, and I think that things can be okay in this game. Yeah, you know, Rob, I I, I heard about that guy who was who was talking about how Garoppolo hadn't had a turnover in four straight games. I, I, if, if you're that, that guy, doesn't know what he's talking about. He's clearly, you know. That's that's some just bad knowledge on his part. I, I would I would say that I think I agree, I disagree with all three of you. I think Garoppolo needs to have a breakout game against the Rams, and, and breakout game meaning he needs to go for two sixty plus in order to win this game. They're not going to be able to run the ball. I feel for you know two hundred and forty yards or two hundred yards, they're going to probably be right around one hundred and twenty, one hundred thirty. They're going to need his yardage to to make up the difference. And quite frankly, if you watch the game, you know, look, looking back at the game against the Green Bay, there's a ball right in the beginning of the game where if it's completed, he's over 200 yards against the Packers with a touchdown. 
And, you know, obviously the interception comes, but he needs to have a big game. He, he might not have to, to lead them down the field at the end of the game to win, but he needs to be able to play well. Um, he needs to play like he played the first half of – like the second half of the Rams game and the first half of the, of the Cowboys game. If he does that, they win. Or if he just comes out and he plays the way that he played the first half of the Cowboys game but they end those drives and touchdowns instead of field goals, that's, what, that's how they win this game. So they need more out of him. They can't go through this game with, with multiple interceptions from him. They might be able to get away with one, but more than that, I don't think that they win. So I'm going to say the opposite. I think that Garoppolo is due for a breakout. He needs to have one. I like that call, Jack, and I think you swayed me a little bit. I I do believe also that in addition to that, he's going to need those around him to step up their game. You can't have the drops that occurred at the beginning against Green Bay. Kittle's got to make that catch against the Rams. I'm willing to forgive it a little bit because, again, I felt that cold. I know how numb his arms must have been at that point because he was going sleeveless. But he and Jawan Jennings, like those are critical catches you've got to make in this Rams game because on offense, they potentially can put up some points. So I tend to agree that that there's going to be some production needed from Jimmy G. Yeah. From the, from the passing game in general, they're, they're going to have to get some stuff out of there. Uh, let's jump on. Let's stay on the Jimmy G topic here just for a little bit. And uh, I'm sure you, you've all seen it by now. I, I put out the article on it, but the the, da- the Dante Whitner comments that he made on, on KMBR on, on Tuesday night about uh, the 49ers should bring back Jimmy Garoppolo. Basically that, you know, if the 49ers win on Sunday, it'll be two Super Bowls in three years with, with Jimmy Garoppolo and that they should bring him back for, for, you know, another year. He didn't say anything about giving an extension, but for another year. And I, who was it that started this time? Was it J- uh, Jesse, correct? Yeah. Okay. So I, I find this comment pretty comical coming from Dante Whitner because this guy's totally flip flopped and I'm not going to do the same thing. I, no, they shouldn't bring him back. I, I believe that there's a lot that goes into this. This team is trying to remain competitive going into the future. If your choice is Jimmy Garoppolo versus guys like Jaquiski Tart, I'm going after Jaquiski Tart and I am starting the kid. I think this team has a ton of talent. This team can add talent if Jimmy Garoppolo is not back on this team. And I think that they can kind of keep things going without him. That being said, as a fan, if the 49ers win, do whatever the hell you want. If you want to erect a statue of Jimmy G, go ahead. I don't really care. You can sign him to a lifetime contract. If that's what you feel like you want to do or have to do, go ahead. Because this Super Bowl win would mean so much. I haven't seen it since... I don't know. I was 12 years old. I barely remember it at this point. I want to see a Super Bowl, Super Bowl victory. So if that's what you think you have to do, go ahead. I do not think that they will do it regardless. I think it would be hard to say we're not going to take any capital for Jimmy because after this year, he's gone for nothing. And we're going to pass up on other guys that were also big contributors to this Super Bowl run when we have a kid sitting there that we told you was supposed to be the future and supposed to bring things to this team that Jimmy could not. Jimmy winning a Super Bowl doesn't change the fact of who he is. We, he still has the same limitations. He's still the same player. There's a reason that Lance is here. So to keep him on this roster and forego some of those other players and forego potential multiple draft picks, I think that would be crazy. Yeah, I, let me start by saying, again, something where where Jesse and I agree is that if you win the Super Bowl, like, do whatever you want. At, at that point, it, it's wild. Like, it, I was 16 when we last won in, in 94. And to, to get another one, I don't know if people realize just how difficult it is to win a Super Bowl. So if you do that with Jimmy Garoppolo, at that point, you're playing with house money. Do whatever you want. I will say... I don't think it's a recipe for success. I think that it was pretty clear that the 49ers tested the theory of their initial logic this season, that they came in and they said, we can do two things. We can keep Jimmy Garoppolo and pay him $25 million and stay relevant this year. We can get to the playoffs and we can spend all this draft capital and bring in Trey Lance and groom him for the future. And we're going to ride both of these. Well, the wheels almost came off of that thing. I mean, they were a, a hair's breadth from coming off of that thing, but they didn't. 
and they were completely redeemed. They totally redeemed themselves, right? Like it was it was that complete spin of, well, now here they are. They're in the NFC Championship game. So it was clearly worth paying $25 million to Jimmy Garoppolo to keep him around this season. And, oh, we saw pretty significant improvement from Trey Lance in his first start to his second start. So the future is pretty bright with Trey Lance as well. So they ended up proving themselves pretty wise in the the strategy that they set out to achieve and they achieved it. But I think you're playing with fire to take it any further, because let's be honest, these games this year were very close. And if one had broken the other way, the Niners would not have made the playoffs. And this fan base would have been incensed. And the argument about, well, you could have played Trey Lance this entire year and had the same result or better, and you didn't, it would have turned into a bit of of a nightmare scenario. And, you know, I mean, let's be real. In in playing devil's advocate, you get rid of Jimmy Garoppolo, you got to bring in a suitable backup. So you're paying that backup, what, $8 million a year? So really, in reality, you're saving, say, $17 million with Jimmy Garoppolo. So it's it's not quite as clear-cut as to to whether you, you, you know, get this huge benefit from moving on from Garoppolo but I think what it is crystal clear to me is the locker room dynamic becomes much more stable if you just pull off the band-aid if you just say we committed to Trey Lance we gave up uh, you know a, a lot to go get him he is the quarterback of the future the future starts now it makes it easier on everyone in the locker room to not have to choose sides if you start losing the wheels don't come off and so to me Nothing changes. You you made your bed. Now you got to lie in it. Jimmy Garoppolo spent this entire year being a good soldier. You can't possibly ask him to do that one more time next year and not expect it to turn into the cancer that it almost became this year. I think me and Jesse might have had this discussion when we said if the Niners win the Super Bowl, you absolutely go with Trey Lance next year because – you're going to buy a lot of time in some 49er fans eyes because you just won the Super Bowl. So if you have a, say a step back with Trey next year, because you know, he's going to struggle. I mean, it's, it's a given that he's going to have some clunkers and then he's going to show his inexperience, but man, if you win the Super Bowl, you can't let uh, the moment cloud your judgment about what kind of financial constraints this franchise has right now. They have Bosa coming up and they have Debo coming up. You have to pay those guys. You have to keep the core together. The only way a window stays open is if you could somehow figure out a way to keep, I don't know, a majority of your core together. If you blow it all on Jimmy on a, on a, you know, mid-level quarterback, who's maybe 15 to 20 in some people's eyes, as far as where he ranks as a starter, that's just, you're, you're that's just not smart business. So to me, regardless of the outcome of this season, you got to move on from Jimmy. Um, you got to bolster this roster, work on your secondary, maybe bring in another pass rusher, whether it's via the draft, via free agency, um, and just you know try to keep this window open as long as possible. And I think in the long run, it, it's going to work out. But uh, to be blinded by if we win a Super Bowl and say we have to keep to say we have to keep Jimmy, I just think that's ridiculous and it's just it's short sighted. Yeah, the, this is this is just an interesting comment from Dante Whitner in the to begin with. Going and and having watched and kind of heard a number of the post post game shows this this year and the things that he was saying about Jimmy Garoppolo and comparing and, and Trey Lance basically calling for Trey Lance to be to replace him throughout the regular season. The first time that I heard him flip on this topic was uh it was actually December 29th. It was when he was he was filling in during as a as a host during the the Christmas time uh, on KMBR, and that was the first time where I heard him say that Jimmy Garoppolo was the best option for the 49ers. The 49ers did the right thing to bring him back and all this kind of stuff and run it run it through with him because all season long he'd been saying something else. So, although I don't have any concrete concrete evidence, you know, I did sleep at the Holiday Inn last night, so I can say that I, I think that somebody got to. To Dante Whitner, and he does in, a, in kind of de facto work for the team because NBC Sportsnet Bay Area is a really strong partner with the 49ers. So, you know, I, I think that maybe there's a little bit of, of that having, having to do with this too. And uh, 
Should Jimmy Garoppolo be, be back with the 49ers? No, I don't think that he should. I think they need to move on. The only way that I see him coming back is if they win the Super Bowl. Maybe they, they bring him back in the, because that's what the owners already said. Right. And, and I was going to mute Rob because he started getting into the answer that I wanted to give. The <laughs> other part of the answer that I was going to give is that, yes, to bring on, if you bring on a, a veteran backup, which I think they should, it's probably going to cost you in the neighborhood of five to six million dollars for that quarterback. Could you get Jimmy Garoppolo to take a deal where you take his twenty five million dollars that he's due to get this year? Uh, next year in cash, that's his cash. That's not the, the cap hit, but the cash of Jimmy Garoppolo next year is about fifth twenty five million. Could you give get him to do a deal where you give him all of that money as a signing bonus, give him a three year contract, eight million dollars for next year, knowing that you're going to just have dead cap the year the two years following that when your ca- salary cap is going to be going up anyway, and you can kind of absorb that and, and play around. Teams are doing that all around. The Fortnite's have guys on their on their team right now who ha- are in that situation where they have dead cap. You know, that's on, on dead years. I think Lakin Tomlinson, if you look at his cap number, actually has cap for next year, even though he doesn't have a contract. So that's the way that they could do it. It'll be fun to see what happens. It's definitely going to be a, a fun topic of conversation uh, over this offseason. And let's just yes, hope that it gets it to the will. point where Jimmy Garoppolo wins the Super Bowl and we are arguing about it for, for six months. A quality problem to have. <laughs> I feel for like sure. all of us will be blinded if we win and be talking silliness. Uh, during a post game live stream on everybody's channel, who's going to be on? Because we're all going to be streaming after the game if they were to win. I'm sure I'll say something stupid and then come back like a day later and be like, "I'm deleting this video." I'm, I cannot believe I just said that. And I don't even drink, so I can't blame it on alcohol. You can't blame it on that. All right, let's uh, let's jump over and let's do this one real quick. We're gonna we got three topics we want to hit. We got about 15 minutes, and I let's let's give like one, two quick, real, real quick reasons for this one. The Rams are going to win this game on Sunday if what happens? I think it's Aaron. Uh, they can get after Jimmy consistently and affect him. Um, and if the Niners secondary has hard time stopping Cooper Cup consistently, I think those are the two things I worry about. Cooper Cup and their pass rush. Those are the two things that are keeping me kind of guessing of how the outcome will be in this game. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair assessment. I, I would say uh, if, if I'm picking two things, it would be if, if the Rams are able to force turnovers in this one and successfully stymie the 49ers run game, that's a recipe for disaster. I, I would see that as the Rams having the opportunity to to jump out in front and a, uh, a snowball type of momentum working against the 49ers. I think as long as this works out to be a, a bare-knuckle uh, type of a, a street fight, that favors the 49ers. But if, if weird things start to happen, and turnovers can cause that, and then again, if the Niners can't depend on that run game to milk the clock a little bit, I think it begins to tilt in the Rams' favor, especially if it's close at the end. you got a better gunslinger in Matt Stafford than you do in Jimmy Garoppolo, but he is weirdly able to come through in the clutch. So who knows? Yeah, I, I'm going to limit it to one thing. And I think it's, if you can keep Matt Stafford from being pressured on a regular basis, this front four gets after every quarterback a ton, and it doesn't just have to come in the form of sacks. It can come in the form of pressures and moving him off his spot. If I'm the Rams, I'm looking at what the green Bay Packers did in week three against the 49ers. I'm surprised they didn't do that more themselves this last week. That quick pass game. You saw it when they implemented it to Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones ate the 49ers alive. He had like over 100-something yards receiving or something like that. They can implement that. They have the players to implement that. They have the running back to implement that. And they have the quarterback to implement that. So if I'm them, I'm taking the pass rush out of it. I'm trying to get rid of that ball very quick. And I'm forcing the 49ers to beat me in a different way. If they can keep Stafford protected, that's the way they can win this game. Yeah, I think my two things are, are first off, the Rams have to stop the run. If they can stop the 49ers run game, they, they're going to – that's number one. And then Luke hit it over here. This was the other thing I was going to say. That if the Rams can get their running game going, those two things. For the Rams, it's all about the run. Everybody thinks about the Rams and Matthew Stafford and the, the passing game, but they need to be able to get that run game going. Uh, that'll That'll – chew up the clock and give the 49ers trouble. So those are the two things for me. The Rams win if they stop the run and if they get the run going. 
Let's jump over to the other side of the ball now. So let's look at the 49ers. The 49ers are going to win this game if they do what, Jesse? If they can limit themselves to one turnover. I, I You know, I, I understand, and you and Rob both brought it up, and you're right. If they can stop the run of the 49ers, then they can win. But that's what everybody says, and nobody can do it. So I think law of averages says it's not going to happen. I think the 49ers are going to be able to run the ball. I think the 49ers are going to be able to stop the run. Now they just have to not turn the ball over a ton. The recipe for this playoffs is one turnover. Rely on your defense to go get you one back. And from there, I think the 49ers can win. So one turnover or less for the 49ers. And I think this they win this game and may win it going away. To me, this game is about physical dominance. To me, this is about the 49ers exerting their will over the Rams. And I think that... Eventually, if the Niners are able to do that and sustain that type of an attack, which requires, you know, getting the run game going, it, it requires Jimmy Garoppolo to play a clean game. It requires him to, to hit some clutch passes, but you will begin to see it in the trenches. You will begin to see it in the body language of both teams. If the Niners can exert that physicality over the Los Angeles Rams at some point, I expect to see a little bit, and I'm not throwing shade here, but a little bit of the tail tucking between the legs and, and a little bit of folding at that point because I do believe the 49ers have the more talented roster. I do believe they have the more physically gifted roster in that respect. And, and what they're looking to do sets up perfectly to just be physical and exert themselves over the Rams. It is reliant upon health and, and reliant upon a clean game by Jimmy Garoppolo. But I would say if the Niners can be the physical team they've shown themselves to be against the Rams on Sunday, then they win. Yeah, the I, I want to say something. Oh, yeah, ahead. I just want to say something real quick. I think it's already showing up, Rob. The fact that this team is so focused on these ticket sales, I've never seen anything like it. You've got the head coach move. talking about it. You've got the players talking about it. The players' wives, which you know is coming from the players themselves. I've never seen anything like it. I feel like it's already mentally, they're already mentally gone. Like they're there. They're ready to be pushed off the edge. The 49ers just got to come in and push them. Yep. Yep. To me, it's all about winning at both lines of scrimmage. If the Niners can dominate on defense at the line of scrimmage with pass rush, and if they could dominate the line of scrimmage with the run game, I think the 49ers, I'm not saying they could blow them out, but I think the Niners could be dominant in this game. I don't think it'll be that kind of game. I think it'll be close because both teams deserve to be there, but Winning at the line of scrimmage, you know, that's kind of the way John Lynch with his old old school uh, methods and uh, ideology from Tampa, you know, you build the team from the, the inside backwards. And uh, the Niners really are built on defense to dominate at the line of scrimmage. And they run a certain style of running game where they like to punch people in the mouth. So if two those two things happen, I think the Niners have a great shot. Yeah, I'm going to go – you guys have all put up some really good good things. And I, I think it's – for the 49ers, it, it's running the ball and it's protecting Jimmy Garoppolo on offense because w one of the things that we've seen with Garoppolo is when he has time, for the most part, he puts the ball where it needs to be put. At least that seemed that way on Saturday to me when he wasn't getting – when he wasn't getting hit or getting sacked, but when he was given time to, to look, he was pretty good with the ball. Uh, and so I think if they can give him time, he's going to do it. And I think he's a little bit better with people around him. Than, than the other quarterback is, mm. as crazy as that might sound. So, one, run the ball, protect Garoppolo on offense. On defense, you got to get after Matthew Stafford. One of the things that I, I don't know about you guys, but when, I watched, when I've watched Matthew Stafford and we saw it on Sunday against the, the uh, Tampa Bay, when the game starts to get tight and he's getting hit and he has bodies around him, he really struggles with delivering the ball accurately. And that's where the 49ers can take advantage of him because this off this offensive line for, for the Rams is banged up just like the 49ers offensive line is. But the 49ers defensive line as a whole with all the guys that they can throw at him, I think can really pressure him. And I mean, that group, this group is, is nine deep. It doesn't matter who's out there. They're getting pressure on the quarterback repeatedly. We saw it against Rodgers on, on Saturday night. It didn't, sh it, you could see it even early on, even the, when they were driving down the field for their first touchdown, you could see the pressure coming. And then it started to come uh, from that third series on once the, the secondary adjusted a little bit. And uh, I, I really think that it, it's, this team has been carried by the defense. 
I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to go off script just real quick. Because somebody brought up Jordan Willis earlier. This team is not in the NFC Championship game if it isn't for Jordan Willis. Jordan Willis against the Cowboys, he's the one that forced the interception that turned into the touchdown that was the game winner. Jordan Willis is the guy who who created the field goal block for, for Jimmy Ward. And Jordan Willis is the guy who blocked the punt that became the, the one touchdown. They're not there without him. So I, I got to give this. Jordan Willis. Sign him to a 10-year contract right now. Yeah, give him Jimmy Garoppolo's money. <laughs> Five year, $137 million. <laughs> There you go. There you go. That superstar backup, right? All right. So there, there you go. There's our 49ers win if, the Rams win if, but we're going to wrap this up real quick. We have about five minutes left, and I, we, we wouldn't be doing the show justice if we didn't give a prediction. I'm go not ahead, sure man. who starts. I think, it's, I think it's Jesse. I don't think so, but I'll go either way. Okay. Maybe you're right. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I just, I, I look at this game and I try to break it down every which way. I, I just don't see a way that the Rams win. Uh, going into that Dallas game, I said my confidence level was at an eight. Green Bay, I thought it was at a five. I really thought that was the NFC championship. And the 49ers, they just have this team's number. And there's a physicality that the Rams just cannot match. Rob talked to, talked about it earlier. I think they're going to fold. I think they're going to eventually fold. We've already seen cracks in the armor with this whole ticket thing. And I just, I don't see a scenario where the Rams win this game. My confidence level is very high. I put it a seven out of 10. I think it'll be close. The Rams team is good. There's a reason that they were, that they're here. There's a reason they won the West, but styles make fights and they are built to stop the passing game. They are built to pass the ball. That's the way most of these teams are built. The 49ers are the opposite of most teams. They are here to run the ball and they are here to stop the run. And they will do both in this game. And eventually the Rams will remember what's happened the last six times and they will lose this game. 27, 24, 49ers. Mm, I love it, Jesse. I I would say something that Kyle Shanahan has said repeatedly, that great coaches are able to get their A players to play at the highest level on a consistent basis. And when I look at both of these rosters, I see a list of A players for the 49ers that I have faith. I have faith are going to come through in this game because the matchup favors them. It favors them in a way that that tilts in the 49ers' favor. And therefore, I anticipate that they will come out. George Kittle, Debo Samuel, our, our defensive line that you mentioned, Jack, will get after the Rams. I, I am not super confident because it's the NFC Championship. I've always got bubbles in my guts at this point because the stakes are so freaking high. But I feel like the Niners are going to win this one. I think it's going to be closer than most people expect, but I still think the Niners have a seven-point lead at the end. I've got the final score, 34-27. To me, it's just all about surviving that initial uh onslaught that you know the home team even though they might be the road team in this game you know just that initial like uh, how games begin where a team looks really hot like green bay looked like they were going to blow us out right or at least i thought that for a second when they were driving for the second score i was like man we're not stopping anything uh survive that initial push but then once the game kind of gets down into the nitty-gritty where the 49ers start to kind of do their thing on both sides of the ball which is running the ball effectively short passing game you know, getting on defense, getting after the passer. I think this game, if the Niners can play their style for the majority of the game, I think this game could end up being like a 38-21 deal where the Niners kind of pull away at the end because the Rams have just physically and mentally have just been beaten. You know, they're like you say, you're, they're already worrying about ticket sales and stuff. Like, you should be focused on your job. Like, who cares about that? You should be wanting to win regardless if you have fans in the stands or not. So, um, for someone who's a natural pessimist, I think the Niners could win this game going away if they can uh, survive that initial kind of that initial surge by the Rams in the beginning. Yeah. So for me, I think this game, I, I'm going to go really kind of with what I've been saying about this 49er team for the last few weeks. The 49ers are going to win this game if they hold the Rams to 24 points or less. I just, if they can keep them at 24 points or below, I think the 49ers win. I throw that number out there because the Friars defense hasn't given up more than 24 since since the the backups of the Cardinals did it without Jaquaski Tart and Jimmy Ward on the field. So if the 49ers defense can hold the Rams to 24, they win. Jesse kind of took the score that I was thinking, 
uh, that's that number sounds about right. That's the number of the last time these two teams played. I just I just feel I feel very confident with the 49ers. That that's who's going to win. Uh, but I just think you need to keep them to 24 or less in order to do it. So I'll say 27, 24 to give you a number, though. I love it. Right on, right on. So, hey, we we got we did it. We even did it on time. We got three minutes to spare. So I, I want to take a take a, ch- a second to shout out Rob and and Aaron for joining us. And you know Jesse, I know he's got another show that he's going to be jumping over to. So just you know, thanks a lot for everybody joining. Hopefully we can come back and do this again, maybe uh, before the Super Bowl and do this again, just because of special times call for special shows, right? And uh, it, it, it's it's great time having you. Aaron's the first time I've been able to chat with you and. Uh, Rob, you're, you know, we've had some good conversations, Jesse, I'll go back to arguing with you on Twitter and, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be all, it'll be all good. But, you know, if I could just ask everybody, you know, the, the Twitter handles for everybody is in the description. I think their links to their YouTube channels are on here as well. Go check them out. And if you're not already subscribed to their channels, make sure you subscribe. They've all got a, a lot of good stuff going on on their, on their channels. Uh, subscribe to this one as well. If you're not already subscribed. But uh, hit that like button, hit those comments, get over to 49ers.pressdemocrat.com and read the, the stuff that I'm writing over there. And like I said, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you guys for all jumping on. And hey, have a great Thursday, rest of your Thursday night, and have a great Sunday because it's going to be fun talking about this game when it's over with. So have a good night, everybody. See you guys. Appreciate you having us on. Thank you.